Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining Joe in this workshop. Um, I want to remember remind you that below is the ask a question area or you can type it in chat that he can help, uh, he can work on and answer questions related to his topic. Um, at the end of his workshop, I'll pull everybody back into the main session to give you a few updates before we take a break. Um, Joe's workshop is When Someone You Love is Transgender. This workshop will outline some of the common challenges families face when a loved one is transgender, including the emotions they're likely to face, the questions they're likely to be asked, and the, the boundaries that, they're, um, that they should use. Um, how to answer common arguments they're likely to hear. So Joe, thank you so much for uh, tackling this really important topic. Blessings upon you, and I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, thank you, Ann. How you doing? Thank you for uh, joining me. This workshop is titled, When Someone You Love is Transgender. I guess the name says it all. Let's talk about how we can relate to someone who we love who is identifying as transgender. Of course, transgender um, is now a very broad term, isn't it? It's an umbrella term basically for a number of identities or behaviors that are outside of the traditional gender roles. Uh, trans Latin, meaning the, the, the Latin term for on the other side of, when something is trans in Latin, it means it's opposite or on the other side of. Uh, cis means on the same side of, so we frequently hear people talking about themselves as either transgender or cisgender. Cis meaning my um, body and my self-identification are both uh, on the same side. Trans meaning there is a conflict. Uh, usually the word transgender is being used in reference to something more specific, which we used to call transsexual or the condition known as gender dysphoria, dysphoria meaning unease or dissatisfaction with a person's status. And generally, uh, it means someone is uncomfortable with or ill at ease with the body they are inhabiting and they identify as the body of the opposite sex. And so they feel the solution in many cases is to transition, meaning transitioning from one sex to another through um, uh, medical intervention and surgery and a number of different ways of uh, attempting to conform the physical to what is identified and uh, experienced. Sean's session was dynamite, wasn't it? One of the best I've ever heard. Uh, I want to only follow up and build on it a little at the more personal level. Of course, transgender refers to an issue and it refers to a movement, but it also refers to an individual. So let's talk in this next hour about our relationship to the individual. Uh, yesterday, when I was talking about how we relate to and discuss with people we love who are gay or lesbian, uh, I mentioned what John said in his third letter, 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. When we are in Christ, the primary thing we want for the people we love is for them to be within God's will. Conversely, one of our greatest nightmares is that people we love will be outside of God's will. And so we yearn for them to be brought back um, to a place of surrender to God. We grieve if they are not in that place. And we have to deal with uh, two immutable facts, love and free will. I love the family member who is transgender my son or my daughter or my sibling or even my spouse, my love for that person is immutable. Their free will is also immutable. So there you go. To love is to, in essence, be held hostage to the way the person you love exercises her or his free will, and you will be impacted by that. And that, I believe, is a part of what Paul had in mind when he said that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I do believe as hard as it is, God also uses our grief over a loved one to work in us a more Christ-like understanding that this is the heart of God. To not try to kill love 
just because the object of our love is outside of God's will and our life would be easier if we didn't feel all of the emotional pain that goes along with love, nor can we kill truth. We don't want to try to revise the truth so that we feel better, and we don't want to try to make ourselves feel better at the expense of our love. It's quite a challenge, but there, there we go, and that is the challenge we face when someone we love is transgender. So what can we do in light of all that? Let's look at our primary goals first. There are, I believe, two primary goals you want to keep in mind. When someone you love has let you know, mom, dad, brother, sister, I am transgender. Sustain the bond, join the work. Sustain the bond, join the work. Let's look at each of those. Sustain the bond, which means just that. You want to do all you can to sustain the bond you have with the person you love. Why? Well, one of the obvious reasons, your love for that person. But there's an even broader principle we ought to keep in mind. God has entrusted you with that person you love. That son, that daughter, that family member, that close friend. God has entrusted you with that relationship. Paul posed an interesting question, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, when he said, what do you have that you did not receive? And that includes my relationships. The wife I have, the sons I have, the friends I have, the clients I have. Our relationships are things we have received and have been entrusted with. And yeah, we will answer to God at the judgment seat of Christ for how we have stewarded the relationships he has entrusted to us. So you want to sustain the bond as much as possible. Now, I, I realize there are times a transgender loved one will say, either affirm my decision, affirm my new identity, celebrate what I'm doing, or you're out of my life. Well, you can't sustain the bond in a case like that. I mean, that is their free will. And in that case, you're in the position of the prodigal son's father when he basically said, look, I will be here. I love you, but... You're going to make your own decision. I can't stop you. But in most cases, yes, you can sustain that bond. And join the work. Now, joining the work means, in essence, you remember that God is at work in your loved one. Oh, and he is. He is. Remember Philippians 1, 6, being, 1, 6, being confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will continue, will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, think about that. God isn't passive, is he? I mean, he's not just some cosmic force that coexists with the person you love. God loves that person. God yearns for that person. God's Holy Spirit still is striving with that person, wooing that person, convicting that person, working in any number of ways, visible and invisible, to bring that person to the truth. Hey, you want to be a part of that work to whatever extent you can. Just like an evangelist wants to be a part of the work of God wooing people into the kingdom. A pastor wants to be a part of the work of, of building people up. You want to be a part of what God is seeking to do in your loved one's life. So there are three levels of that work I want to discuss that you want to be striving for when someone you love is transgender. Stabilizing, clarifying, dialoguing. Stabilizing, clarifying, dialoguing. We'll look at each of these. Stabilizing means basically you want to make the environment safe and stable. This gets hard because of the emotions involved. When someone tells you something you don't want to hear, <clears throat> you're afraid, you're angry, you're shook, you're concerned, you're heartbroken. It's emotional. And you better believe it's emotional for your loved one as well. He knew you didn't want to hear that. She knew you didn't want to hear that. People don't casually come to their family and say, I've decided to transition. That is not an easy announcement to make. And no, that doesn't make it right. No, it doesn't mean it's God's will. It's completely wrong. I, I realize that, but it's still very, very difficult for that loved one. So for everyone, this is a volatile situation. You want to be the stabilizer as much as possible. How do you do that? You create a sense of safety and, and a place where that loved one feels hurt. Now, safety largely is developed by you saying, okay, let me reassure you. This is how I feel about you. Yeah, I'm shook up. I didn't want to hear that. I'm afraid. I'm angry. I'm going through all of that. And after all, you knew me. 
You knew I was a born again believer. You know I take the Bible as the inspired, uh, authoritative word of God. I'm sure you knew this would not be easy for me to hear, but let me remind you in the middle of all that, you are so important to me. I mean, you are still the same person I've loved all along. So let me reassure you, nothing is going to change that. I love and value you, always will. And I do want to hear you. I want to hear what this has been like for you. I love the way James put that, James 119. Let every one of you be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Listen. Be sure to listen. So you create safety. That's stabilizing. Second is clarifying. Once the dust settles, okay, you've told me the news. I understand. We're both shook up over it. This will not be easy for either one of us, but let's make the environment safe. We're not going to call each other names. We're not going to accuse. We're not going to make unreasonable demands of each other. Let's be safe with each other. Now that we've established that, let's clarify some things to each other, like what we are wanting from each other. Let me explain what I want from you. I want us to be close. I don't want this to come between us. We are not going to agree on some key factors, but that doesn't mean I don't want our bond to be intact. So you, you want to clarify that. This is what I want. And yes, I will fully admit, I also want you to rethink your life, to rethink your decision. That is true. I can't impose that on you. And we'll talk about that. But I'm not going to pretend I'm neutral on this. Of course, I disagree with you and would like you to rethink what you're doing. But keep in mind, I do want us to stay close. I want our relationship to stay intact. That's what I want. Now, a real important question. What do you want from me? When you tell me you're transgender, you're giving me information. Now, in light of that information, what are you asking of me? And be sure to listen carefully. Because oftentimes your, your loved one is going to expect that you're going to preach, you're going to condemn, you're going to correct. What you want to let that person know is, I'm all ears. What do you want from me? And what do you expect from me? Those are generally two different things. What you want from me may very well be more or different than what I can give you. You may want more from me than I can give you, more approval, more affirmation. You may want something different than what I can give you. You might want me to adopt a different worldview, a different way of seeing things. You may want something other than what I can give, but then there's expectation. What at least is a reasonable expectation? What do you want of me? What do you expect of me? Um, there's good reasons for this, by the way. First of all, it's the right thing to do. As James said, let's listen to people. You also establish credibility and safety when you listen to people, because that is a way of saying, I am interested in your life. I do want to know. I want to be close to you, and part of being close to you means understanding you. Now, of course, when you talk about what you want of each other, you do it with an understanding. Neither one of you is getting everything you want. That may not happen for some time. Your loved one wants you to have a change of mind and heart about this. You want your loved one to have a change of mind and heart about this. The question becomes, and this is what I would say to a loved one, if a loved one said this to me, whoa, are we big enough? Do we love each other enough to sustain our bond even if we're not getting exactly what we want from each other. In short, are we both adults here? Can we be reasonable and mature about this? Now, I do realize if you have a son or daughter who is a minor and has told you that she or he is transgender, your discussion is not going to be quite that magnanimous because you must still retain authority. I thought Sean beautifully described a conversation between a father and son, uh, if a son has made this announcement to a father, whereby the father is saying, I do want to understand, I want to hear you, but as your dad who loves you, I also need to reestablish the fact that, in essence, and now I'll use my own words, you will decide when you become an adult what you are going to do with your gender identity and your feelings. My hope is that your decision will be in conformity to God's will. But regardless, it is a decision you must delay until you are an adult. 
and I will retain that position in your life, but that doesn't mean I don't want to hear and understand you. Then in response, of course, you clarify where the lines are drawn with each other. That means you're going to establish some boundaries. There are three scriptures I think especially helpful um, when we're determining boundaries. And let me say in general, I conceptualize boundaries as being what we do or do not allow. They're not just what we do or do not like, because uh, there, there's a lot we can compromise in that area. In any relationship, you put up with things you don't like. Boundaries have to do with what I will or will not allow. Uh, Paul said in Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That tells me I can love, respect, be in relationship with someone who is outside God's will, even someone who is practicing some form of darkness, but I cannot come into communion with them in that kind of darkness. So just for example, if I had a friend who was a non-Christian who liked to tell dirty jokes, I would have him for a friend. But if he started to tell a dirty joke, I'd have to say, hey, whoa, 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 got to hold on that guy. That's, that's not really my thing. I couldn't come into communion with him on that. I know what we're talking about is much more complicated than just a dirty joke, but the principle is the same. I cannot come into unity with you on the area of your life that I believe is so outside God's will, but I want to be with unity, uh, in unity with you as a person. So have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. First uh, Timothy 5.22, Paul said, do not be a partaker or a participant in someone else's wrongdoing. He also, though, Paul balanced that out nicely in Romans 14.23, as much as lieth within you, be at peace with all people. That tells me when someone I love is outside God's will, I want to be in a peaceable, good relationship with that person as much as possible, only when they are pushing for something that would cause me to come into agreement with their wrongdoing, only then would I have to draw the line. Now, the most obvious example of that on this subject would have to do with identification. If my loved one says to me, Joe, I was born biologically male, but I now identify as a female. I have chosen the name Elizabeth. I want you to call me Elizabeth address me as she, I want you to recognize and validate that. I would have to say, I sure recognize and validate you. I respect you. I love you. But I would never ask you to do something which violated your conscience. Please don't ask me to do something which violates my conscience. I will not impose on you the name you've rejected. If I have known you as Bob and you now wish to be called Elizabeth, I will meet you halfway by not calling you Bob. And I will strive not to refer to you in a masculine or feminine way. I will just say, how are you doing? It's good to see you, my friend, or it's good to see you, honey or beloved. I can choose other words. Don't ask me to adopt the identity you have adopted because I can't. Now, I would not ask you to go along with something you believed to be untrue. Please don't ask me to go along with something that I believe to be untrue. I simply can't. Don't put that demand on our relationship because I'm not demanding that you change your mind about the subject in order to have a relationship with me. Please don't demand of me that I change my mind on the subject in order to have a relationship with you. Don't we love each other enough that we can do that? That's what boundaries will be about in your relationship. And that leads finally to dialogue. See, the first part of what we do, let's stabilize things. Let's try to make it safe with each other. Let's take a deep breath. We understand this is hard, but let's reestablish the fact that we love each other. We are family. We have a bond. We want to sustain that. We are in different places as to how we view things. We are in the same place, hopefully, though, in the fact that our relationship is a priority to us. And according to that priority, let's keep our bond intact. 
Then let's establish our boundaries, the areas that really have to do with what we might call non-negotiables. And let's see if we can't come to an understanding of the terms of our relationship. Now, let me backtrack a little and get more personal with you, okay? I almost feel like an idiot talking about this because I do not have a loved one who is transgender. I have not dealt with what a lot of you are dealing with. So I realize it's very easy for me to sit here and pontificate about how you do step one and then step two and then step three. It's all so nice and neat. Please believe me, I understand it's not so nice and neat. I have had emotional disputes with my own parents over my own sexuality when I came out to them as a gay man back in the late 70s and early 80s. I do understand, though I don't have a firsthand knowledge of this issue, I have a firsthand knowledge of the family tensions that happen over sexuality and gender. I do. And I realize the emotions are like tidal waves at a time like that. I further realize you are having to deal with something more than your loved one's behavior. You're having to deal now with the way your loved one will henceforth be presenting himself or herself. And you more than ever are going to need the support of the people you love in your life, the spiritual mentoring of your pastor, quite possibly some additional mentoring from a therapist or min, uh, ministry leader. You'll need to be taking care of yourself. You'll need to be finding joy in your life and the areas of your life that still bring you joy. You're, you're going to have to do what is necessary to sustain yourself through all of this. This is very hard. And I have worked with many parents who have had to deal with a son transitioning from a male to a female identity and, and uh, with a daughter transitioning from a female to a male. The grief is indescribable. The ongoing pain is indescribable. All of that is a given. But in the midst of that, these are steps that I believe you can take. The dialogue is one of them. You start with stabilizing, then you move to boundaries. Now, this is a point where a lot of family members despair and they say, well, I can't change his or her mind. I don't want to argue. I don't want to fight. I'm just so sick of the subject. Can we just drop the whole thing? And sometimes you have to and sometimes that's the wisest thing to do but i want to submit that there are times dialogue is still possible dialogue is a primary tool god uses to further his purposes in people dialogue is a primary tool god often uses to further his purposes in people much of what god has commissioned his church to do involves dialogue communication, preaching, teaching, reasoning, interaction, communication. Therefore, dialogue is oftentimes revolutionary. I find it's revolutionary also because in dialogue, there is frequently, especially if it is I to thou, the two of us, it is done in a context which is more reasonable and vulnerable. At a rally or a conference or a political event, when people are arguing with each other and the air is electric, people, in my opinion, don't tend to be as authentic. They tend to just dig into their positions and shout at each other, um, which is one of the reasons frequently the Pharisees would come and almost be ganging up on Jesus and and. Frequently, the interactions were not redemptive. He would just tell them, hey, you're a bunch of vipers, go. <laughs> but uh, then there would be the dialogue, the conversation, when Nicodemus comes by night and says, let's talk more about this born-again business, you see? So dialogue, it still happens. Uh, let me offer a few ideas on dialogue that I find helpful. Once the smoke is settled, the boundaries are established, if the individual is willing to have dialogue, here's a good place to start. This one sentence, help me understand your process. Help me understand your process. Okay, I know where you stand. You know where I stand. We disagree with each other. But I would like to better understand what this has been like for you. As in, when did you realize you felt this way? What was it like when you first realized it? 
Did you ever tell anyone? Did you think you could tell me? What was it like keeping that secret? What conclusions did you draw? Yeah, this is where we really can exercise our empathy, and empathy goes a long ways towards both solidifying and healing relationships. When people try to reach across the divide and say, you know, I cannot relate to your specific experience, but your general experience I can relate to. And you know what? You can. Now, can you relate to being transgender? Probably not. Can you relate to what it's like to have feelings you didn't ask for? To have a secret you're afraid to tell? To feel different from others and not sure what you can do about that difference? Ah, you know you can relate to that. Well, then you can relate on several levels to your transgender loved one. Now that you can do. And again, that's a, a critical, critical component in both uh, solidifying and, and healing a relationship is the component of empathy. Help me understand your process. What's it been like for you? Then second question or second statement, really, it's a request. Help me understand how you reached your position. The process is what your loved one experienced. I feel like I'm in the wrong body. And look, no matter how strongly we disagree, and no one disagrees more strongly with the conclusions of the transgender movement than I do. I am against it. I believe it is based on falsehood, and I believe it is a dangerous movement. That said, you got to appreciate how profound it is for a person who really feels the torment of thinking he or she is in the wrong body. The torment of thinking, ah, everything I see testifies against everything I am experiencing. That's a conflict so profound that in many cases, the individual is willing to spend thousands of dollars for medications, risk all kinds of personal and social rejection and family rejection, even submit himself or herself to all sorts of surgeries, radical surgeries in some cases, to conform their body to what they feel. Now, look, you wouldn't go through all that unless you really felt strongly about your identity and strongly felt that the only resolution to it was to try to transition and become something else. So that experience has been profound. So what you're trying to do is say, I want to understand your process. I also want to understand how you reached that position. Now, this is, needless to say, a very different time. Up until now, up until the, the recent past, if somebody said, I feel like I'm in the wrong body, well, the medical profession, the psychiatric profession, and the culture at large would say, obviously the problem is with what you feel, not with your body. If you feel you are in the wrong body, we need to treat your feelings, not your body. Because your body is your body. And you're not able to change that, which I believe is true. Well, of course, we can change our bodies, but we cannot make our bodies into something they are not. Which is why I will say plainly at the outset, I don't believe there is any such thing as changing your sex. I don't think it can be done. But I think that uh, if, if someone feels something other than what they are, they need to work on the feeling. So if I said, I feel like I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, you would say, well, Joe, the problem is obviously your feeling, not your body. So let's work on your feeling. We are in a time now where the intuitive is overriding the factual. And I find that to be one of the most frightening aspects of this time. The intuitive is overriding the factual. If I feel it, if I intuit it, if I experience it, that's what matters. Don't bother me with the facts. What I feel is what really overrides and, and trumps everything else. Now, this is especially true today because our younger generation largely has adopted a strong, strong, strong commitment to fighting injustice. Or I should say fighting perceived injustice frequently. But one of the highest ethics they have is fight injustice. Wherever somebody is oppressed, you need to fight the oppressor and defend the oppressed. And people are hungry for any cause in which they can do both. Fight the oppressor, defend the oppressed. Therefore, if you tell that population 
the transgender individual is the oppressed, the traditional viewpoint is the oppressor, that sense of fighting for justice will even override facts. So people will say, well, no, no, no. It doesn't matter if you really can't turn a male into a female. It's justice that you try to do that. It's unjust to try to keep somebody from doing that. It's unjust to say that you don't agree with and even celebrate their decision to try to do that. That's why I say if we feel something is an injustice, that overrides the facts. And that's the times, that's the context we're dealing with now. And the bad news in all of that is that your loved one has some very powerful voices telling her or him, hey, your parents are wrong, the Christians are wrong, the church is wrong, the traditionalists are wrong, you are victimized by their transphobia. Now think about how powerful that is. You've got a long-term conflict from early in life, perhaps, you felt you were in the wrong body. You've tried to make that feeling go away, and the feeling is still there. You start seeing that there is an option. You can conform your body to match the reality you feel within instead of the reality your body testifies to. And so many experts are telling you you should. I mean, presidential candidates, politicians, leaders, psychiatrists, psychologists, teachers, People of all ages and from all professions are saying, yes, you're right, you should. Some pretty strong stuff when powerful voices are affirming something you are considering. And there you are, a voice saying, sometimes the lone voice saying, no, no, it's not right. Well, this is why I say, when you ask somebody to explain their position, you must understand that part of what is fueling their position is, is the widespread, the tidal wave of support that they're getting and reassurance. But that doesn't mean this is a lost cause, not at all. And, and let's be quick to remember, God has always enabled people to go against the tide. That's the legacy of Christianity. And so often when people are fully convinced that they are right, wholly deceived, fully committed to their deception. Yes, God interrupts them. How did we get one of the primary figures in church history, Saul of Tarsus? He became Paul the Apostle. Who could have been more committed to his wrongdoing than Saul of Tarsus, a zealot who believed God called him to persecute the church and God turned him around? Now, that could happen to a Saul of Tarsus. It could happen to anybody. So all is not lost. But a lot of that piercing of that false confidence can happen in the context of dialogue. So it can be helpful to say, help me understand your position. How do you arrive at truth? How did you arrive at this conclusion? What is your worldview? Those are three significant questions. How do you arrive at truth? How do you decide what's true? How did you arrive at your conclusion? How did you decide that this is the direction you should go? What is your worldview? Do you believe the Christian worldview, an atheist, an agnostic worldview, a New Age worldview, a Gnostic worldview? Help me understand. Then having done that, you ask permission. May I share with you my worldview? This is where the subject becomes not a moral issue, not just a doctrinal issue, an apologetics issue as well. Acts 17.2, Paul had a habit a pattern of reasoning with people. That's different than just preaching to them. It's trying to reason with them. Now, when we're reasoning people with people, what is happening? We are providing words, prayerfully seeking God by his Holy Spirit to use the words to pierce between the soul and the spirit of the people we are speaking to. Any evangelist would tell you that. The evangelist prepares. Greg Laurie doesn't just walk up to the stadium without preparing his message. He does his part. He thinks the message through. He prepares it. When he speaks it, he realizes, I can't save anybody. I will do what I can. I will trust God to do what I cannot. That's exactly what you're doing here. You're wanting to have a dialogue and explain your position in saying, this is what I can do. I can explain why I believe what I believe and I must trust God to do what I cannot. So what do you do? You try to reason with the person. Can I help you understand my position? My position is based on a few questions. Do we have a creator, yes or no? 
I find it reasonable, I find it logical to believe that if there is a creation, there must be a creator. So I have concluded that we do have a creator. Now, if we had a creator, if we have a creator, there must be such a thing as created intent, mustn't there? You never create anything without an intention. So if we have a creator, it is logical to believe that our creator created us with specific intentions in mind. Are those intentions evident? I would argue that they are evident both by observation and revelation. Observation, the physical body. What does my anatomy testify to? Now here, let me go back to the issue of the intuitive versus the counterintuitive. I don't believe that intuition has the final say. My intuition can be wrong, but there are also certain intuitions that seem basic to both Christian and non-Christian people. That's why I love Sean pointing out that it can be very helpful to look at secular resources who rely on secular reasoning to reach many of the conclusions we have reached. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say we are forcing a whole culture to ignore what it intuitively recognizes. We are either male or female, and you can't become something different. And we're trying to force people to basically violate their own intuitive sense of what is right or wrong. So with that in mind, I can say, yes, I believe we have a creator. I believe our creator created us with intentions, and those intentions are evident by observation and also by revelation. Why revelation? Because I believe that our creator communicated to us in a divinely inspired document. Why? It doesn't make sense that a creator would create living beings and leave them ignorant of what he had in mind. And so what do companies generally have? A charter or bylaws or people have a constitution or whatnot? Some document that shows them this is the intention of the founders. Well, the Bible, I believe, to be a divinely inspired for many reasons. One of the most obvious is God didn't want to leave us ignorant as to what he intended. Now, what do we find in that? Are those intentions evident? We, we believe we have a creator. I believe that our creator created us with intentions that can be seen both by observation and known by revelation. Are those intentions evident in our bodies? Yes, they're not fully realized, but they're evident. They're not fully realized in that we were created never to die. We were created to have perfect bodies, and we don't. But the intention is still evident, not fully realized, but evident. We are a fallen world. Uh, that's why we look to Genesis 1 to tell us what God intended, Genesis 3 to tell us what life is like now. Interesting point uh, made by Andrew Walker in his book, God and the Transgender Debate. Excellent book, by the way, Andrew Walker, God and the Transgender Debate. Uh, he points out that even in Genesis 3, in a Genesis 3 world, there is a Genesis 1 blueprint. Even in a Genesis 3 world, there is a Genesis 1 blueprint. I think that's true. It's like what Paul said to the Romans, all creation groans waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. There is some knowledge that we were meant for something more. And for that reason, I believe exactly what Paul McHugh, who's a distinguished professor of psychiatry at John Hopkins Medical School said, he said, there's no such thing as sex reassignment. Why? Quote, chromosomes cannot be re-engineered, removed, or scrubbed from the software of the bodies. Therefore, with complete respect, if I have shown my transgender loved one, I do value you, I want our bond to stay intact, I respect you, I want to hear you, I want to better understand both what you've experienced and what your position is. Having established all of that, may I respectfully explain to you why I don't believe in what you're doing. It's not just because it hurts me, although it does. It's not just because for me it is devastating to see you reject what I have celebrated before you were even born. The first thing that was said about you was your sex. It's a boy. It's a girl. I still love that. And yeah, I'll admit it's devastating to me to see you reject what I still love, what I still celebrate. 
But that's not the reason for my position. Those are realities that go along with my position. Ultimately, I simply do not believe you can change what you have been assigned. And your sex, yes, I believe that is something assigned. So I hold to three principles. One is the principle of ownership. I believe our bodies belong to the one who created them, not to us. Oh, we're managers of those bodies. But managers answer to the owners. I have a certain authority over my body, but I will answer to the owner of my body. So Paul told the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 6.19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. I believe in the principle of ownership. I also believe in the principle of stewardship. 1 Thessalonians 4.3-4. This is the will of God, that you abstain from fornication, that you experience your sanctification, and that each of you possess your vessels with honor. Those vessels are assigned. And I do believe in that assignment. Principle three, for ordination. I don't believe your sex is an accident. I don't believe it's changeable. I think it was foreordained. So God said to Jeremiah, before I even formed you in the womb, I knew you. I believe when you try to change your sex, you are trying to do what cannot be done. And in the pursuit of doing that, you are rejecting what God has foreordained for you. For those reasons, I cannot tell you I celebrate what you're doing. But I absolutely celebrate you. I always will. Now, what do you hope will come as a result of those sort of conversations? You want improved communication, you want improved consideration, you want to see conviction, and you want to see conversion. Let's look at each of these four C's, and we'll end it with that. Improved communication, start with that communication. At the very least, you want to see improvement in the tone and the content of your conversations. That's one thing you pray for, one thing you strive for. Secondly, you pray and strive for consideration. You are hoping that as a result of this kind of conversation, your loved one will begin reconsidering assumptions she or he has had. Because face it, this is the age of repetition, isn't it? A lot of people just repeat, repeat, repeat what they heard in the news cycle, what they saw online, what they saw somebody tweet, and they just retweet, they repeat, they retweet, repeat, but never examine. You want to get them to reconsider. So you go for communication, consideration, then conviction. You pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. Convict my loved one. Awaken my loved one's conscience. Call my loved one and say, I am your creator. If my loved one has never known you, has never been born again, call my loved one and say, I want to be your father. I want to be your shepherd. I want you to be mine and I to be yours. Convict, draw, cause my loved one to see their need for you and the wrongness of what they are doing, because only you can soften the heart through the conviction of your Holy Spirit. And finally, of course, you want conversion. If your loved one's not a Christian, the gender identity is a secondary issue. Your loved one is lost. You want conversion from death to life. If your loved one is a Christian, and I know in many of your cases, that's the case, then you want a conversion from error to truth. The same spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in us and is at work in the hearts of the people we love and in their lives. That same spirit absolutely can create a conversion from death to life and from error to truth. What do you do in the meantime? You hang on to what Paul said. I know who I've believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. If you'd like to pursue this more, I do have a video series just for families. It's called When Someone You Love Is Gay. It uh, covers all of these principles in much more detail. You can find that at joedallasonline.tv. joedallasonline.tv. Or you can just go to my website, joedallas.com, either way. Let's take some time now for your questions. I'm going to check the box and see what are the uh, most commonly asked ones. We've got here, how do we help a five-year-old grandchild understand their biological, who is our son, is transitioning to be a woman? This is asking a lot of children. A lot. Thank God children are resilient. They can adapt. 
and I trust that your grandchild will. A lot of this depends on what kind of a relationship you have with your grandchild um, and how much permission your son is giving you to speak into that grandchild's life. You must respect the father's position with your grandchild as strongly as you disagree with it. So I would suggest first and foremost, stay as much as possible in good standing with your son and as much as possible build and keep rapport with your grandchild. That's a start. Um, I don't know what sort of terms or boundaries your son has laid out with you. Your son probably understands that you object to this. I don't know if your son has told you that you may or may not discuss this with your grandchild. So um, uh, proceed cautiously when it comes to talking with your grandchild. But I don't see anything wrong with questions. Uh, I'll keep getting back to this again and again. Questions are great ways to get the ball rolling. Like if I had a grandchild in this position, I would probably say, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How are you and dad getting along? How do you feel about what's happening with dad? Now, let's remember your grandchild is probably very bonded to dad. Your grandchild doesn't want to accuse dad. Your grandchild doesn't want to in any way uh, be disloyal to dad. So probably that grandchild is going to be reluctant to just openly say, I think this is weird, but open the door, let the grandchild know you're there, and uh, then try to be sensitive to whatever terms or boundaries your son has placed on you. But within those terms and boundaries, try to keep first the relationship going with your grandchild and then secondly, dialogue going with your grandchild, okay? And God bless you in all of this. This is, uh, I know it's gotta be a very hard time. Uh, next question here, knowing that there are likely to be gender dysphoric and SSA individuals in our churches, especially longer congregations, perhaps, how can we best influence our lead pastors to create and offer a safe and healing atmosphere so that all areas of brokenness can be addressed, truth with compassion be, can be proclaimed, and the body of Christ can be helpful in community towards those individuals with the mindset of discipleship and the sanctification process? James, did you just say a mouthful? Yeah, okay. Uh, in general, what I think we need to do is pretty much what you described. We need to say to our churches, there are issues we face. We need to know the truth about these issues according to God's word. So let's look at what the word of God has to say about the hot topics of the day. Homosexuality, same-sex marriage, abortion, transgender race and racism. I mean, let's not be shy because good night, everybody else is talking about this stuff. We better be talking about it in the church. We can encourage our pastors, please be sure you're feeding us. You're helping us understand from a biblical perspective how we should view these issues. What is the truth? Then help us understand how to apply the truth. How do we apply the truth when we're dealing with people outside the truth? And within our churches, how do we apply truth to people who are wanting to live in conformity to truth? One of the biggest heartaches of mine when I started my ministry back in 1987 was so many churches wanted to preach against homosexuality, so few churches wanted to help someone who had repented of homosexuality. So it's important to tell our own congregations, hey, these are human issues. You may deal with them yourself. Plenty of Christians have same-sex desires. Plenty of Christians have gender identity confusion. Plenty of Christians are sexually addicted to pornography, et cetera, et cetera. We want our church to be a safe place where you can say, I want to live within the will of God. I confess that in some ways my life would take me outside of that. What I feel, what I experience, help me. And believe me, you will find help here. That's a general message we want to put out to our congregation. So on the one hand, I think we need to be bolder and clearer in standing for truth. But we mustn't leave it at that. Because Jesus was full of what? Grace and truth. Truth compels us to speak the truth. What has God said about this? Grace compels us to apply truth to those who want to participate in the grace of God in their own lives. So that, that's basically what I would encourage of all of our pastors. 
Uh, what advice would you give a parent who did, didn't have any idea how to respond in the way you just outlined and made mistakes? Well, who the heck hasn't? When the opportunity to dialogue is long gone, estrangement, I did ask questions and offered unconditional love, but then we became politely distant. He demanded acceptance and approval. Gretchen, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear this. We all are. I'm not sure what mistakes you made. Sounds to me like you did a pretty good job. As I said, it's very easy for me to sit here and pontificate about what you should or should not do, but it's sort of like when when my wife was pregnant and we were reading the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting, and we went to the Lamaze classes and everything was, and then you do this, and then you say this, and she says this, and then expect this, and it was all so nice and neat. When it actually happened, it was like, ah! you know, I should, and, and nothing went completely the way all the books said it would go. The difference is that was a joyful occasion. This is a hard one. Um, bottom line, reach out, make sure that um, he knows I'm still here. We're still here. We still love you. If you know you did say something wrong, apologize for that. As in, look, I want to tell you, I did say some things I regret, and this is what they are. And for what it's worth, I want you to know I was wrong. I'm not apologizing for my position. I'm apologizing for the way I expressed my position. And I hope you will forgive me. And this really is something all parents have to face in this. And, and let me broaden the, 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 the topic a little. I believe that nobody gets a straight A report card in parenting. Nobody. Um, we have all fallen short. The question becomes, to what extent did our shortcomings contribute to whatever issues our sons and daughters may have. That's a very subjective call, it's, and it's very hard to prove either way. I mean, I understand if parents have been overtly sexually or physically abusive or routinely humiliated their children, or they've been very irresponsible and largely abandoned their children, well, then yes, I'm sure that that directly impacted their children, and the impact is evidence of the struggles the kids are having. But in many cases, especially when it comes to these cases of sexuality and gender, you don't connect the dots all that easily. In some cases, it's very clear. Mom rejected or, or mom told the boy that she wished he was a girl. Dad said the boy acts like a girl. The boy grew up believing he's a girl. Okay, that's kind of a no-brainer, but plenty of cases are not that clear-cut. So I always say, don't go on an excavation to find out what you did wrong. Concentrate now on owning what you already know you did wrong and seeking to do what's right. Because, important point, the how is always more important than the why. Why we are dealing with what we are dealing with, yeah, that matters to a point, sure. Um, it's instructive. But you know what? It, it doesn't necessarily change anything. I mean, I, I, I could go into analysis for 20 years and find out why I have all the problems I have, and that would help to a point, but I'd still have the problems. The how, how do I deal with it? That means more than the why, you see? So I, I really think that's where you need to place the emphasis. Um, I, I also feel that for parents, part of the problem, especially today, is that there is so much encouragement to reject the parental voice because frequently the parental voice represents a, a traditional worldview which our culture is largely rejecting. And because of that, that's the context we're having this discussion in, because of that, your son or daughter has options and influences that sons and daughters in prior generations did not have. Whether it's coming out of the closet or abandoning your family to pursue your sexuality or transitioning, attempting to transition from one sex to another. At one time, to do that was to do something that didn't involve a lot of encouragement and support. Now, your sons and daughters are being offered both a trampoline and a platform. They really are. Kids today from very early in life are being told from teachers, politicians, 
influencers of all sorts. Hey, if you're trans, if you're bi, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, to heck with what the church says, to heck with what your parents say. You're right, they're wrong. Jump and we'll catch you. Here's a trampoline. We'll offer you immediate support, immediate empathy, immediate community. It's all there. Not only that, we'll give you a trampoline and then we'll give you a platform. You can go on TV interviews. You can write books. You can develop a whole career based on your victimhood as a lesbian or a gay or a transgender. Now, face it, when people are offering both trampolines and platforms, for a lot of folks, that's very tempting. I say all of this to point out, you mustn't assume that because your son or daughter or loved one is making the wrong decision, that is a reflection on you. Where you have been wrong, admit it, own it, but don't presume that that's the sum total of what has influenced or created the problem. The problem also is the context that your loved one lives in now. The powerful voices and above everything else, the problem is your loved one's own capacity to make the wrong decision. Whether it's the decision to be rebellious, the decision to allow deception, the decision to become hardened at heart, whatever it may be, you can't override your loved one's capacity to make a decision and to exercise free will. That is the bottom line. Hey, I do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for your questions. It's good talking with you. Uh, we'll be going back into general session, I believe, in just a second. So God bless you. Good talking with you. Thank you.